Heck yeah. You having a good time at Expo? Awesome. All right, let me scoot this over so I don't have to lean over so much here. Um, how many of you have had a chance to play the Uncanny X-Men on the floor? Yeah? Heck yeah. Um, so we brought a good portion of those, and we tried to invite as much of the team as we could up here. Um, I think we have enough chairs. And if there's anyone else in the audience that we weren't able to get up here, I apologize. Uh, but it takes a village to make one of these things happen. And you can see on the screen over there, the game team, uh, the list is enormous. And this is only a fraction of the folks that actually are involved in making something like this happen. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm Jack Danger, lead game designer. I'm Wayson, lead software engineer. Kevin Kaloje, uh, lead engineer. Jerry Thompson, lead sound designer. Woo! Zombie Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> David Liskovic, uh, display artist. Mark Renesis, display artist. Zach Stark, also display artist. Uh, Mike Kizavet, uh, programmer. And uh, Josh Henderson, game software developer. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, round of applause, please. Thank you. Uh, and like I said, just a fraction of the folks that are involved in this. Um, it, it, it takes so many folks to actually realize a pinball machine. Um, and we can't wait to show you the path we took to create the Uncanny X-Men. It's been an interesting one, and uh, let's get right into it. So by hitting this button, obviously many different skills are needed to create a pinball machine. We just introduced most of the folks here that are the design, software, art, uh, sculpting, music, sound effects, animation. Um, Charlie Benante, who was just up here, did the soundtrack for the game. Um, Jerry did all the cool sound effects. We did a lot of VO, uh, a lot of tuning of jams and stuff like that. Um, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, all the folks that are on the line. It is, uh, it is a huge list of people and we can't thank them all enough. All right. So, uh, I'm going to start off with prototyping. Um, when I get into a game, I like to, I like to bounce ideas off of people. But what I like to do is uh, a lot of designers work differently. Um, a lot of folks will jump right into CAD. Some folks will uh, be in SolidWorks immediately. Uh, I work digitally, um, as you can see up there. Um, how many of you are familiar with Blender? Yeah? So um, I'll use different like simulation softwares, but also use Blender to try to like visualize when I like you know pull models or create models just to like get an idea of what's going on there. But by uh, iterating digitally, I'm able to like save wood and save metal and try big changes on things without you know disrupting sort of like a piece of wood that I have. Uh, here in front, you could see uh, a white wood that we built, which is mostly like blue painter's tape, uh, plastic that I've hot glued, um, 3D printed models from Kevin. Um, just it, it's like every single type of thing you could do to create a physical ramp or whatever. All those wire forms are stolen out of the, the trash cans at Stern and I hand vent and cut myself on. Um, obviously you can see they don't go where they're supposed to, but I just needed the ball to do something there. It's just looking at what the entrances are doing. Um, but so I'll start here and what I do is I just get like a good feel of what needs to happen with the game. And then that's when I start working with this young man here to uh, have him tell me that all of this is BS and we need to actually make it real. And so um, here you can see like the digital simulation of, you know, this is me testing out the shots and it actually works pretty well. And if it works like 100% on the computer, it works 75 to 80% in real life. Lower, 30% in real life. <laughs> um, but again, this does help me like get a good idea of what we need to do for like heights and stuff like that. There's actually a really good diagram that we didn't print out that showed like how each ramp and stuff is stacked on top of itself. Uh, this thing is a spaghetti monster of like wireforms and ramps going around. In yeah, well, I, I took a look at your model and I said, well, Jack, this ramp is colliding with this ramp. With your physics is a little broken there. Just a little so, bit. Just so yeah, he, he needed to give me an elevation map of where where are these heights and how does it stack up? Because there's a lot of things that crisscross and weave, especially in the back back end of this playfield. Absolutely. Uh, and telling him that something needs to move a skosh or three fingers up doesn't work at all. So uh, I learned how to use a ruler on this one. Uh, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Gomez, for uh, t the tutelage. <laughs> Um, so once I take that drawing and we move into CAD, um, we'll go back and forth on like drawing uh, shapes. Can you see this, Kevin, on the screen? Uh, we'll go back and forth. So, you know, uh, this is when I start pulling in real parts. 
Kevin and I start working a heck of a lot closer now because we have an idea of like a roadmap of what we want to do. Um, and so bouncing back and forth and so, okay, here's this nightmare you see before you down there. This was clean at one point and then I just started like gluing stuff and bending stuff. And there's a really cool bash toy. I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but that's actually the, uh, the, the, what the Ghostbusters, what is that thing? The containment, the containment, yeah, the containment unit. unit. <laughs> um, I took one of the raw model. I ruined like a priceless piece of uh, pinball history um, mm -hmm. by putting that on a hinge, drilled some holes in it, and made it a bash toy. So when you hit it, it like flopped backwards. I'm like, check this out. But you know, that someone probably would have you know wanted that. Elliot, right? uh, Elliot <laughs> thank you. Are you here, Elliot? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Stole that right out of his office. Um, moving on to some more prototyping. If you're not familiar, there's a, 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 a mechanism on the premium Minelli called the Beast Lab. Um, this is an elevated captive ball very target. And these were the initial like concepts I had for making something like that. Uh, on the far, far left was just plastic cardboard and I think a chunk of something off of Iron Maiden. I don't know where I got it from. Uh, the center one was me completely decimating a slingshot and a captive ball to make it move. And then with the help of like Kevin and Rob Blakeman and them, um, we were able to create this mechanism that you see here. Uh, if you wanna hold it and touch it later, it's pretty awesome. It feels kind of like a laser gun when you hold it. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, cool, laser guns. Moving on. Uh, more prototyping, <laughs> you wanna speak to any of this stuff here? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> So early on, uh, kind of the, the idea was pretty nebulous um, of what exactly the mechs were going to be, but um, the concept of Sentinel breaking through the play field was there from day one. Um, you know, your, what you were just showing, the Whitewood had the space for the head where the, where the Ghostbusters toy was. That, that was known, like, we want to have the head there, we want to do something there, but what do we do with the hands? Um, so I, I remember vividly we had a meeting pretty early on in the in the at our temporary building that we the three of us were spitballing ideas of you know maybe we're we're flicking the ball backwards or maybe we've got a finger or maybe we were breaking things or, or, or um, have you ever played the uh, um, was it the the Freddy the ni oh yeah nightmare yeah. yeah Nightmare on Elm Street game it's got the claw yep. that 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 knocks the ball off the off the ramp we talked about things like that um, but we settled on, on on an idea of well what if what if the hand broke the wire form yeah which is something I don't think I've ever seen before we've seen ramps that move of course especially the uh, Godzilla had a good inspiration of. Of, of a breaking breaking bridge, but breaking a wire form takes it to the next level and immerses immerses the player in the story of the game. So um, the mechanism of it is is pretty simple. It's just a, a, a simple linkage underneath and a single coil, but getting the interfaces correct and getting them to stay stable and then how does it lead in and lead out was super that, easy to do. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was it was finished right away and we moved on. <laughs> no, it was easier. It was easier for you than we thought it was because like I would challenge you. I was like, we can't actually do that. Like I was like, if we broke the ramp, do you think we could break it in half? And you were like, yeah, I, I, we could totally do that. I was I didn't believe you because you made I, it sound so easy. To, to be very honest, the the what the final version of it on the playfield is very similar to the initial version. It never really changed much. Um, the, the concept of it worked well. It was mostly a packaging problem of how do we, thanks Jack, how do we put this <laughs> in a place where I don't have access through the play field? No room, no <laughs> access, balls have to move under it and around it. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. That was the hardest challenge with it was how do we package it so we can actually have the linkages do what they need to do. Heck yeah, but you, you did it, my dude. Um, so speaking, you can see here we have a sculpt of the hand, but in the far right photo, you'll see a cardboard tube with a rough sentinel head <laughs> drawn on it. Um, I tried to bring that here, and it started disintegrating, so uh, I'm just going to leave it in the back of my truck. It got hit by a lot of balls. Yeah, it got hit. We actually, <laughs> like, I would stuff a Dunkin' Donuts yeah. cup in it to make it rigid so we could actually shoot it to see what balls were doing off of it. Uh, yeah, it's evaporating. Anyway, but so we needed to know what these sculpts looked like. And so we relied on our good friend Zambietti to uh, help us conceptualize that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Man, man, man of many words. Um, so uh, you can see we 
initially we had an idea of, you know, we wanted to show damage on the Sentinel's face. Um, and we had a, a Mechorillion that did this thing where it like rotated and the different faces did different things. And it just became this giant convoluted thing that just really uh, would have, we'd still be working on it today if we wanted it to even function properly, let alone look good. And it just didn't, uh, it didn't look good or it, it might have worked. <laughs> Well, it just, if, if, story stays out from our side. Yeah, true. <laughs> one, one, Thanks, Arch. One note, if I remember correctly, the challenge was, because Jaws had come out, the challenge was to make a Sentinel eatable. Eatable, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. That was one my... show them up so bad. <laughs> yeah. The way I recall, that's the conversation. And to be completely honest, we had this thing eating a ball. We're like, we... we're going to show them what's up. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, there, there, there was a version... Ellen. There was a version of the Sentinel that had a, a scoop inside the mouth. The mouth would drop away, and you, the ball would go into a scoop, and it would fire it back yeah, out. Yeah, but, you know, why is the Sentinel yeah. eating a ball? Who knows? Yeah. It, um, yeah. <laughs> so you could see the different iterations of damage we were trying to do for the different faces there at the bottom. Um, and then, you know, we gave Jeremy an idea, like, we needed this hand to break a ramp. We needed this hand to, like, flick a ball back. And, uh, yeah, he sketched all these bad boys up. But what we actually ended up with was um, a really awesome, like, what what do you call it, cell shaded Yeah. Um, so Jeremy had this really awesome idea of, like, cell shading this to make sure everything felt comic book about this game, right? You know, it's the X-Men. It is a comic book. We want everything to feel cohesive. Um, and we were able to still get away with the, like, damaged effect by uh, painting in some destruction on the face, but also, like, the jaw breaks away. So you still get that sort of uh, visual feedback that you did something on the game. Uh, do you have anything else to add to this? No. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> By the way, I want to point out um, the finger that flicks the ball, we bounced back and forth, whether it was the index finger or the middle finger, but the middle finger felt a little inappropriate. So we uh, we, we <laughs> settled with the index finger. It's also too much on the nose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, here you could see more of Jeremy's awesome artwork. Again, when when we needed the idea for the Sentinel head sculpt, uh, we obviously wanted it to feel cohesive with the cabinet art that Jeremy had done. So, you know, shooting him some images of, like, uh, rough 3D models and stuff or letting him draw over things or to, like, sort of iterate how he felt he needed to to make this really stand out. I, I think the back and forth worked out tremendously well, yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> Gee, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the help, Jeremy. <laughs> well, uh, do you want me to make it longer? No, I think you're doing great. <laughs> uh, no, the, the, only thing, the only thing I'll add to it to stretch this out so Jack can uh, take a break <laughs> is... Uh, no. Uh, so I usually start on uh, back glasses and cabinets uh, because a lot of this stuff's being iterated. And so that, that's by the time this happens, I've got a pretty good idea of look and feel direction on everything else. So what Jack's getting at is by the time it comes in, then we go, oh, let's make it actually match. Yeah, match, please. <laughs> match with Yeah, no sure. kidding. Uh, and if anyone's trying to rip off the model, those are the Pantone colors there on the screen if you want to match it exactly. All right, there you go. Um, so we also, uh, Wolverine is like the X-Men, right? He's like the, the X-Men character that everyone knows, loves, remembers. Uh, your grandma probably knows who Wolverine is. And since uh, Deadpool and Wolverine came out, also like a, a, a great resurgence or like uptick in like his visibility. So we knew we wanted, Wolverine obviously is a big part of the game, but we wanted to integrate him a little bit more. So we had Jeremy sculpt and do a turnaround. Uh, well, he did a turnaround of like what Wolverine would look like in like his vision, but still something Marvel's like this is Wolverine. And then we used that. And Chuck Ernst's team and all the 3D modelers and stuff created this really awesome sculpt of Wolverine being thrown in the pose of the fastball special, which actually is a mode in the game that I believe Josh created. Yeah. Heck yeah. Thank you, Josh. Awesome. All right. <laughs> um, here's just a quick look at like the, the life cycle here. Here's like that, you know. Um, trash can here in front of you, uh, sort of like an in-between place, like a Whitewood 1, Whitewood 2 scenario. You know, we have like some sculpts. Um, what we're shooting in that middle one should be like 80% of the way there, maybe a little bit more, but then we tweak a little bit beyond that. And then on the right, there's the finished product that you better all have in your houses uh, by the end of the week. All right. <laughs> All right, let's move on to LCD art and animation. We've got a lot of good screens on here, but let's hand the mic over to 
Zach Stark. Sure. Hey, Zach. Hi. How's it? How how's the LCD art and animation going? Good. So far, that it's going fantastic. <laughs> Still working on it, actually. So, Zach, what 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 was your role in this game? So my role, our, our team's role, we get it usually at the tail end after you guys have figured out the the play field, um, the flow, and the generally most of the cabinet art is done, and. One of the things we always try not to do is animate Jeremy's art. <laughs> <laughs> That's been a rule of thumb. Don't don't commit to animating Jeremy's cabinet art. It's, it's too, too good. good. It yeah. can't be animated. <laughs> it's unanimatable. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, on this game, we my role was uh, to sort of delegate out the tasks of animating Jeremy's art. So, it was, <laughs> uh, and then I, I also did uh, a lot of the interface stuff with Jack. This is one of the first times uh, Jack has tackled Flash with Ooh, me. Ooh, Flash! Awesome. It was incredible. Awesome. Heck it yeah! Was, it's I love working in Flash. So, um, a lot of the stuff you see up here, these backgrounds were drawn by. These were drawn by Phil, correct? Phil Gullet. Yep. yep. Phil Gullet drew all these, um, colored them, and like then. They were broken up into pieces so that, you know, uh, in the very, like, motion comic style, you could, like, break things up into Z-Space and do camera moves around it to give some motion to what otherwise would be a, a flat piece of art. Um, and then we used these as the backdrops for all the characters that um, here is some zombie Yeti art that you had to animate. Yes, we did. Yep. <laughs> it looks this awesome. This is a lot of Mark Renice. Mark Renice, anima yeah. Mark Renice's animation, yep. Lots of parallax. <laughs> yeah, Zach was saying that we sh we try to avoid animating um, Jeremy's art. I had to animate Jeremy's art. <laughs> <laughs> you, did it, you did you did better than me in many ways. <laughs> what it did. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, un for this type of game, because normally we can get away with doing three stuff in three three D with Blender, for example. David did a lot of the Sentinel animations in in parts of the game. But there's a lot of stuff that just has to go traditional. So this kind of followed the same workflow as uh, like any Marvel comics or comic book artist would have to do pencils, inks, flat colors, et cetera. So. Heck yeah. And yeah, another big proponent, obviously because the Sentinel is such uh, the big bad in this game, we had to have the Sentinel on the screen as well. So David, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, David. Yeah, so oh, luckily I didn't have to animate Jeremy's art because we I just animated this. Um, so the 3D model that I actually did all my animations was actually just based off of the exact one that's on the play fields. Uh, we just solidified it and just made it 3D printable. Same with the hands and all that. So it wasn't, uh, I don't think I had too bad of a time, but... Um, yeah, it was just, uh, yeah, just make stuff look cool. You know, I just would go to Jack and Wayson, and they would just be like, hey, we need them breaking a ramp. We need them doing this. And, yeah, that was uh, pretty much the process. Yeah, the art team did a really great job of, like, trying to bring a comic book to life, which is not an easy task to do, especially, you know, with uh, limited resources and limited time that we had. So they did an excellent job just, like, bringing the cityscape to life, making it feel alive, making the centrals feel, you know, threatening and imposing. And that was always our goal. Yeah, and everything you see on the screen on that game has been created by our team. And like, how how much content Zach Stark do you suppose is in this game? Like, is there a uh, all of it is all of it's in yeah, there? We, we made okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's all, all of it's it all in there. Is, uh, made from scratch. One hundred percent of it is made from scratch. I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's a it's a lot of great stuff. So like, anytime you see anything happening on that screen, know like someone on our team drew that, animated it. It, uh, none of that was pulled from reference. We created every single thing that is on that display. A lot yeah. of late nights and tears. Yeah, buddy. So many tears. Um, tears and beers. Tears <laughs> and beers. Um, all right. Let's let's uh, let's jump over to Jeremy again, if you don't mind, Jeremy. You, you son of a gun. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about how you approached uh, the art on this game. Well. Uh, and there's there's art behind you if you want to oh. reference the art. Yeah. So so here's what I here's how I remember it because I don't always remember it correctly, but uh, this is my memory of it. Is uh, Jack had a white wood, and I said, uh, "No one's gonna buy this. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing here." <laughs> and uh, so anyway, so uh, yeah, no, I just started. Um, I took. I always take some time at the beginning of every project to try to think through uh, and experiment a little bit to see what kind of angle I can get to 
you know, get excited. I had just done Venom, um, and I was like maybe a little burnout on comic books uh, at the time. Um, and uh, and so I was like, oh, I love X. Like this was like a project I wanted to do. I love it. I absolutely love it. I gotta I gotta find my angle. I gotta find my angle. So I spent a lot of time sort of iterating and and coming up with different ideas on what it could look like. Obviously, I knew the uh, X-Men 97 cartoon was coming back. Yeah. Uh, and I am a huge fan, and I was so excited for that. So I also know Jack comes from an animation background as well, and I do as well, and, and just about everybody up here, except for Jerry. Jerry. Uh, and uh, <laughs> he's in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> uh, and uh, so so uh, um, I, I actually... Took, yeah. I took, I took, I mean, we started together on Ghostbusters, no big deal, but, um, and so, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So, so, uh, um, uh, so I, I just tried to kind of meld a style, uh, of, of sort of the classic era that, that I grew up with and something maybe a little looser, a little more animated, uh, to some degree. Um, and, uh, you know, then I, I just started playing around. The one thing that I wanted to do on the play field was try to support uh, the weird design Jack gave me. Which was, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, it's very asymmetrical. Yeah. There's a lot of things that, you know, I never have encountered. I mean, a lot of games do follow certain structures, and, and so I just tried to support the game and, and uh, do what I could. So, um, And then, uh, if I recall correctly, when it came to the play field, I think I got a Zoom call from George Gomez. George, maybe you could verify this. <laughs> where you requested that I do the playfield ink and color and get it to you final, ready to print in three weeks. Is that correct? Three weeks? <laughs> Was that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and didn't I also? Wasn't my my what? Didn't I say the one request I had was I get a week vacation afterwards? <laughs> anyway, whatever. Um, Commit to it right here on stage. <laughs> but no, I did. No, let's say no, no, no. At the end of the day, uh, um, it, that was a good challenge. I appreciate it. I learned a lot of things uh, doing that. So, um, and yeah, my my whole thing was I just didn't want to disappoint fans because I'm a fan and I absolutely love uh, you know the X Men and and uh, the storyline that we chose is is very near and dear to me. So, um, you know, I just tried to do something that people would complain about on pin side. Yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> just, just, just one guy. Um, no. So, Jeremy, I have a question for you. Uh, how hard was it knowing that we have such a broad cast of characters that you had to draw everybody and make sure it was accurate and to what Marvel wanted and what fans expected? Well, so first off, the Q and A section is when we're done. <laughs> oh God, wait, I'll, wait, one of you ask that after this is over, please. We we need to. Uh, Need. It's a it, it's a lot. Well, that's a, that's a lot of uh, responsibility more than I mean. It's a lot of work too, but it's a lot of responsibility. Just I just try to make sure that um, I put the time in to where I get to the point where I'm not deathly afraid. Yeah. Um. Uh. And and uh, I've had a pretty good working relationship uh, with Marvel. Um. I remember this one was a little more difficult because uh, Greg Freres, uh, who who was my art director, who I don't know if you know, recently retired. Um, he checked out Beca man. because of you. Because of <laughs> you. this guy, <laughs> this guy checked out. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm sorry. By the way, stick around for Greg for the next one. By the way. <laughs> Ask him about it. No, no. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> He's like another Marvel. <laughs> anyway, um, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And uh, um, so, so yeah, it, it was very daunting. It was very difficult, and trying trying to come up with sort of my own version and keep it cohesive with a large cast of characters yeah. is a challenge. Um, and, um, you know, it's it just – you just keep going until you get it right. And my man. I just didn't want to disappoint uh, you. Me, yet, yeah, uh, that's personally. true. Don't ever disappoint me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Please. Is it working? Give it a second. <laughs> Can I add something to that? All the characters that Jeremy um, – all the 12 major characters and villains and stuff. I had to animate that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that. That's where I was going next. Yeah, no doubt. By the way, he did he did an amazing job. Uh, it's almost uncanny. Bum, bum. Uh, Very. Boo this man. 
<laughs> Reach under your seat for the tomatoes, folks. It's been... Just Olivia Moon, we had uh, David Liskovic, Mark Renesis, Chuck Ernst actually did a lot of uh, animation himself. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mimi Ernst, Denai, can't pronounce his last name. Samurai Pizza, Pizza Cat, Cat is what he goes Samurai by. Samurai Pizza yeah. Cat, yep. Uh, Here, let's a go. A little bit of Patrick O'Connor. Um, am I, Mark Galvez, uh, oh, Tom Mimi Ernst. Am I crazy? Ev ev Jesus. Everyone sort of touched this project. Tom Kids, of course. Samurai Pizza Cat. It says yeah, I put Samurai Pizza Cat up there because I don't know how to spell his last name. <laughs> <laughs> Not our next title, by the way. That that was a could be a code name though. Ooh, <laughs> stop giving stuff away. Um, yeah, here you could see some cool like uh, work in progress stuff of Jeremy's back glasses, um, figuring out like what we want to be a pro or a premium or an LE is always a very fun conversation that uh, we decide what we want and then maybe sales and marketing has a different idea of what they want. Uh, and then it's a lot of mixing and matching to figure out like what looks the best is the best. Um, and again, you can see here, Jeremy just, it's a completely different art package for all three and the LE specifically has different sides. I, I would like to make one note because I've never said this out loud and I never admit defeat. But uh, there was one point in time where it came up where um, w there was a question about the LE on, on the two sides. Sure. And I have to say, uh, Seth <laughs> Davis. <laughs> Get him. You were right. <laughs> you were absolutely right. And, and uh, I actually ended up doing uh, uh, something a little different after a, a, a little bit of a note from Seth, and, and it turned out way better than Heck yeah. I Tell had. So. How much yeah. that hurt to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, it hurts a lot, but but we go to the same barber, so. <laughs> it, like, we, we get to work in our teams and, like, bounce ideas off of each other, but it is through the guidance of, like, George Gomez, Seth, our producers, and all that, that, like, well, like, George will come in and, like, with the head mech, you know, guys, this thing, I don't know if you're going to have enough time to develop this thing. You know, it, it would take a team of 12 engineers in a year just to have this thing. Like, you know, you may not want to hear it, but in the end, it's exactly what needed to happen. And it helps us, uh, puts us right on track. Yeah. So thank you, George. Um, all right. Let's talk a little bit about the software. Oh, software. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you want to jump to the next screen? So early on in the project, uh, as Jack was developing the game, uh, he started playing with the idea of putting a sentinel in the middle of the play field. So we were sharing an office at the time at TUI mm -hmm. uh, when we were in between buildings, so to speak. And we were looking at it. And he's like, I really like this idea of being able to battle a sentinel the entire time. So I looked at him. I looked at the Mac, and I was like, I have the perfect storyline for you. So there are a few of us here that are really big X-Men fans, me, Jack, Jeremy, Mark. Um, kids of that over here, right? Uh, am I leaving anyone out? You? Jerry smiles yeah. <laughs> pretty big. <laughs> George? <Jerry. laughs> George, of course. George George is a huge X-Men fan. Yeah, he has a wealth of knowledge. Yeah, he likes to remind me that like his comic collection outdates mine by about 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so we picked one of the most iconic X-Men storylines, which was Days of Future Past, where if X-Men in the future are mostly gone, they're missing, they've been uh, imprisoned, some of them have been outright killed, and it's a pretty bleak future. And it was a little bit, it was a good storyline to start with because it's a little different from our other X-Men game that I had the pleasure to work on, me, Kids of that, and anyone else here who worked on it? Jerry, did you work on that? No, I was no? not. It was before was Jerry, before. unfortunately, yeah. yeah. But Jerry's friend, David Thiel, yes. worked on it. Nice. So Jack and I kind of threw out some ideas of how we wanted to do this, and we thought about the whole dynamic between the future and the past and how we, if you went back to the past, you changed things, and that would affect the future. So we developed this uh, flowchart to kind of try to explain that. It's a little convoluted just because no, that's time travel. Straightforward as possible. Listen, time travel is complicated, okay? 
Like, have you figured out time travel? I think <laughs> not. <laughs> so we spitballed ideas about how to break apart the game and really kind of have almost two concurrent games running together. So it was a big challenge for us trying to design this. And, you know, we wanted the past to feel like a familiar experience, something out of a, any other pinball game that you would do. You know, you have your missions that you go on, the X-Men, there's some multi bowls that the X-Men have to overcome. It's like your standard main play pinball right. game. Yeah, exactly. But then we wanted to suddenly throw the player into this kind of world where everything has gone wrong. Yes, the Wayne the world, Wayne world time absolutely. Time. And uh, it was, you know, it, we wanted to make sure that everything you did in your normal play affected that. So that's the direction we went through. And we planned this on very, very early on because we knew that if we didn't get this just right, that it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. So with the help of like the art team, we conceptualized like all the storyboards of how like, and with Jeremy's help too, like how X-Men would look and sound from one version to the next. So if you go into the future, the X-Men sound a little bit different. They sound a little bit older, a little bit more tired. They say things that are, you know, maybe not as optimistic, right? And then uh, the art team did a good job of differentiating, you know, this is what things look like in the past. Things. This is what things look like in the future. We wanted to take all the artwork that they created and make them create it twice. So we made their job <laughs> twice as hard. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But a little different. Yeah. But you'll see that as you go through and you play through that, you know, something that looks familiar now looks destroyed. So, and we wanted to convey that sense with not just the artwork, but with the music and the, uh, the lights. And every, even the speech, the sounds, everything, Jerry helped with the sound, making sure everything sounded, you know, like a normal pinball machine in the, in the past. And then, you know, making it sound a little bit worn, tired, a little bit sadder in the future. Um, wanted to talk about um, the artwork in the future and how you guys did, handled all that. I know, like... Um, Phil did the artwork for the past and the future, and we still have more some additional stuff that we're gonna come out with. Yeah, we have we have a lot more content coming for sure, folks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But like, uh, David, tell tell us about like the Sentinels and how you brought yeah. them up in the future. Yeah, so we had like this whole mode, and uh, we kind of wanted uh, the future is supposed to be kind of hard. It's like this reoccurring mini wizard mode. So we had like the Sentinels constantly land and you have to destroy them in order to escape to the past. And then um, the way that the future is, is you, um, you're playing as Kitty Pride in the game. And when you get, first get warped, her whole goal is, goal is to basically run towards a Sentinel facility. So we kind of created this really cool, like these, all these landscapes that interconnect and uh, she like just runs behind like these different objects. And it's just, I don't know, it's this really cool, like, uh, uh, you just get the sense that like someone's like really scared going through this whole area and it just worked out really good especially with all the light show that they added i feel like the future and the depths what really changes the future in the past for me when i play it's just like the whole game goes dark and it's just this really cool like moment that happens that you uh you don't see too much heck yeah um here can we pass the mic to mike this one doesn't really no oh yeah, there's, yeah. There's a one. you have a mic yeah, yeah. This is Mike Kizavet. Um, <laughs> I'm double mic'd. <laughs> so, Mike, what was your take on all of this? Um, oh, <laughs> the entire presentation? <laughs> yeah, right. How's it oh, going God. so far? How's it going so far? Mike, Mike, was, Mike yeah. was working with us. 40, 42? <laughs> Mike was working with us really early on, helping us. He wrote um, a lot of rules for the modes. So tell us about the eight modes that we had. Oh, yeah, the eight uh, regular modes. It was cool because I... Uh, usually I'm added on to a project later, so I'm doing a lot of sound effects and speech and display effects and stuff, so it was cool to be more involved in the rules this time. So basically, you know, you have the eight different modes. Each mode features a character, so I wanted to try to bring, you know, the rules to match that character, you know, and I would have, I would come up with a general idea, like, for example, Rescue the Innocent. Well, you know, what have we got for Bishop? He's got the 
pop bumper there, so it would be best to try to use that pop bumper in some way. So, you know, I would come up with a general idea of, you know, I'd bring it to waste and go, okay, hey, this is my idea. You know, what if we, you know, split the the shots every time you hit the pop bumper? You know, it starts as one, and then because he has the power to absorb energy, you know, it'll make then it'll go to two. You hit it again, then it goes to three, and then he's like, okay, yeah, give it a shot. So, I'd put that in, and then it's like, well, you know, this isn't that much fun. You know, let's Let's uh, look at look over again. What if what if it just boosts the score and you've always got three shots over? Okay, let's tr give that a shot and hey, it works, you know. But always try to not just make up a rule, but make it up, theme it as well, integrate the theme into the rule as well. And then you know there was also uh, Waste and Wanted, and I agree because I I like this style of design is that. There's an easy way to beat the mode, and then there's a harder way to beat the mode, and there's a more rewarding way to beat the mode. So you could just, you know, shoot a few shots, see the, the, you know, all there is to see, or you can stick around and try to to beat the clock and get a better score. And every mode has a perfect in the end, or if you if you do it just right, you get a big bonus at the end. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So later on in the uh, development, Josh joined us. Um, he had some of the pop bumper rules, some of the secondary rules we have, and he added the fastball special. Now, the fastball special came about because uh, Jeremy and Jack wanted the, you know, the Wolverine flying through the air. I suggested why don't we put the Colossus behind him, make him look like he threw him, and it just naturally evolved to a fastball special. And then Jack was like, hey, I want to put an insert in the right out lane. And I was like, we need a rule for that. And we did that kind of later in a project. So he, we were bouncing ideas back and forth on each other. And I had just hung up the phone with him. And I looked at the play field. And I was like, called him back right away. And he's like, what now? <laughs> and <laughs> no, he wasn't that rude about it. No. We're, we're a very angry married couple. Let's <laughs> um, no, but he was. I was like, Jack, we missed the obvious. Mm -hmm. Fastball special. Mm -hmm. And um, so I tossed it over to Josh. And Josh, if you want to talk about it a little bit. So first of all, kind of off topic, but I just want to give a shout out to Brett Rubin because he did the light show for when you start the future yeah. and the whole yeah. game goes it insane. Awesome. It is like, beautiful. Like the code for that is so complicated, I don't understand it. But like, <laughs> and I'm I'm a programmer. I'm supposed to understand that, so maybe that's kind of uh, concerning. But he did a great job with that, you know. And uh, to quickly talk about that, we we both kind of agreed that we wanted the future to really contrast with the past, um, really because we had the multicolored GI on the play field, you know, like the reds, the whites, and blues. And so like you see when you're in the, pa uh, you're in the, the past, um, you know, it's bright and colorful and hopeful, but then when you get into the future, it's kind of this melancholy blue. And then when the Sentinels start attacking you, then it kind of flashes red like warning sirens. So, you know, I like to do stuff with GI and stuff like that to really immerse the player in a different world like that. But yeah, in terms of the fastball special, we had that insert, and Wason and I kind of came to the same conclusion about, you know, let's take the artwork and the back panel artwork and uh, do something cool with it. So it's a fun rule. I think it's on the code on the show floor. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. So you get it if you complete the Nightcrawler targets enough. You roll the ball through the right return lane, and the whole kind of idea was I just wanted a rule that, like, it's you're basically simulating Colossus throwing Wolverine at a target. So holds you roll through the right return lane, holds the ball on the post, and then you got like this two shot combo you gotta make. You gotta shoot the left ramp for Colossus to throw Wolverine, and then you got the sentinel lit, and then you gotta hit that sentinel and complete that combo. And really the goal with that rule was just to have something where you finally make the sequence and it just feels great. It's like you're at you know, you're playing a baseball game and you're trying to hit a home run. And, you know, it just has, and we hope to polish the rule a bit more at better light shows and stuff. Uh, but it's a really cool rule, great implementation of the theme. And um, in general, uh, this was a fun project to work on. You know, I quickly joined this project after helping out with WIC. And it was great to work with you guys. This, this, is, this is an incredible game. Heck yeah. yeah. So just because you brought up Brett and I was going to bring him up also, uh, Brett joined the project. He's not here today. But he joined the project about the same time Josh did. And, um, you know, I appreciate when he joined the team, he was like, hey, I haven't gotten a lot of chance to do rules. So he asked me if he can do some. So he jumped on some stuff, made Beast Lab, like, not only as cool a mech as it is, like, make it feel as cool as it should. Yeah. 
So he did a lot with that. He did a lot of our lights and a lot of our stuff, and we appreciate his contribution as well, even though he's not here today. Heck yeah. All right, now we're going to put Jerry Thompson on the spot. Hey, Jerry. <laughs> Hi. Oh, he's done a lot of bike time this weekend. <laughs> yeah, Jerry does a lot of work for us. I, I like to be busy. busy. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, I, I'm sorry, I stepped on you. Say it again. <laughs> Hall of Fame, Jerry Thompson. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you. you yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I've been fortunate to do several games with Marvel, um, Deadpool, Avengers, Venom, and uh, now the X-Men, and uh, they're great to work with, but they provide all of the voice work for their products. So we send them a script, and um, they cast the actors, and they record it and send it back to us, and then I get to cut it all up. For this game, I, and I don't know if you know how recording sessions work, they'll, they'll do two or three takes of a line so that you can pick the one you like best. So this one, um, I cut up over 3,700 pieces of audio <laughs> for speech. So the, there's but there's a Venom. I I didn't count Venom, but I, I think Deadpool is the largest voiceover uh, ever. But um, so so that was uh, you know we knew what to expect there. Wason worked with Charlie Benante and guided him on the fact that you were going to start the game and be in the 80s. And I mean the stuff he sent the, when I first heard it, I was like. Not only did he nail the 80s vibe, but just the sound of the instruments back then and everything else. I mean, it's, it's like he knows something about yeah, 80s right. music. <laughs> he might go somewhere. <laughs> yeah. um, he, uh, but I mean, I, I just I love the stuff. I love the sound of it. And uh, so my then so that part was done. Speech, music, and so it, these are iconic sounds for these characters. I mean, in the animated series that everybody knows so well, you have an idea of what Gambit's card throwing sounds like, or the energy of Bishop, um, you know, the kitty pass through. And so I wanted to be true to those and respectful of those and, and put my spin and, and a pinball spin on them so that when you're playing, you're like, oh yeah, this is what this character sounds like. And you kind of just, without even knowing, and then the other obvious parts, I mean, a lot of what I do is guided by what Jeremy or the artist does. I mean, we you see Subway on the on the play field or, or the city or the highway. So those are obvious sounds, you know, the sound of a subway going through or the city traffic and uh, the X jet lane. And so things like that, I mean, that makes it a whole lot easier when I know exactly what, you know, is going to be on the play field and what it should sound like. So. Yeah, and it's... It's fun sitting in with the Marvel people. Obviously, they know their characters. They know how their characters should sound like. And when we were, you know, the team put, put together a script, and when we submitted our script and they were reading it off, they were like, wow, this is really good. Did you hire, like, a professional writer to do this? And we were like, no, we wrote it ourselves. <laughs> so it was like... Well, the world's biggest X, well, second biggest X fan, <laughs> X Men uh, fan. Uh, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, they know how their characters sound. Right. They, like, most of the time, like, you don't even need to do much direction because they get it right away. So it's it's really interesting seeing their process because they're not just recording for us. They're recording for, you know, they when they bring in a voice actor, they're recording for all sorts of different products. And we're just one of them, so it's yeah. The, the, um, in the studio, he showed me one of their products. It was like a, I think a, uh, was it a, um, a helmet? Did you, you remember that? Yeah. That had speech in it. I mean, they do all sorts of products, and we are one of them. So. Yeah, and there's um, they hire like professional voice actors. They're out in like the LA area. And what was the the voice actor you were a big fan of? Oh, it was. Uh, I remember who it was now. Oh my it god! Was, uh, no, it was <laughs> the, it was the, I think it was the writer, wasn't it, of Krampus or something like yeah, that? Oh right, was the voice was actor the voice also? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And Mike is a big, uh, like Christmas and Halloween movie buff, oh, yeah. so he was, he was overjoyed to sit in that session. <laughs> Definitely. Um. So hopefully, and you know, I, uh, hopefully you're immersed in the world of X Men when you play. That's that's my goal to. To make it feel like you are are in the environment. Yeah, so. I think you nailed it, my guy. Thank yeah. you. And once again, we have to thank Jody for getting Charlie to do two games back to back. He's <laughs> not in the room right now. Oh, she's busy, but. Hall of Faming somewhere. <laughs> but yeah. we we wanted someone who knew the '80s and knew could do '80s and could do modern music because we wanted to do post-apocalyptic, you know, modern-sounding music. 
And we were like, who has the talent to do both 80s style music and modern music? And yeah. he was like, you've got to have Charlie. Absolutely. I did a lot of like sharing Depeche Mode songs with them and stuff. I'm like, just do this. This is what <laughs> I, I want. All of this. <laughs> we can only do so much Depeche I Mode. I, I want, love Depeche Mode. I want, Dep I want Depeche Mode. <laughs> All right. Um, lot, lots of great shots of like, okay. I, I just want to do one last shot. I, these inner art blades that uh, Jeremy did are so freaking cool, but it, it – we tried something unique with these where um, the characters <clears throat> are this sort of like matte vinyl in front, but everything in the back, it, obviously this doesn't translate in a photo, um, but the, the backgrounds are like this foil and like a, a mixture of like foil and matte uh, vinyl sticker like that. I, I'm not sure if we've done something like that before, but it is absolutely gorgeous when you see it because the characters freaking pop off of here. And um, the cabinet, the foil that we did for the LE was interesting because we didn't want something too metallic where, like, if you didn't catch it in the right light, it was too dark. It was, just, like, just enough. But I just wanted to show, like, the LE, if, if we don't have an LE on the floor, I'm guessing. Yes. Yeah. We do? Yeah. Holy crap. Okay, go look at the LE. If you look at the if you look at the right side, that's the past. You know, you have Wolverine and Kitty Pride in their costumes. Everything's nice and, like, on the on the cusp of like something going south but if you look on the left side wolverine is like old man logan and kitty is like obviously aged and and if you look closely at the armor uh we beat up the armor on the left so there's actually like slashes and cuts taken out of the armor something you wouldn't really notice unless you're really looking for it but it's just thematically to match what's going on there um but dude everyone absolutely knocked it out of the park with this so with that what i'm going to do is open up the floor to Q and A questions, if anyone has anything to ask specifically Jeremy and only Jeremy, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> he will give one word answers. <laughs> Hello. Uh, first of all, congrats on the game. We were able to play it for the first time last night, and we were just blown away. Heck yeah! So thank you. So you you guys did a lot of you know zany stuff here. You got an offset main set of flippers. You've got the danger room. You've got the hand. Um, were there things that you knew you wanted in the game and you had to fight for more than more than other things or there stuff that you stuck to your guns on and i i would say uh i i remember showing george this play field and he's like you got to put this in front of gary because it's um you know this isn't something that is common right like the the lower third of a pinball machine was called an italian bottom for a reason for many years it was like uh the history is overseas was a very good a very large market for pinball and uh, they preferred the two in lanes, two out lanes, slingshots and flippers, and then that's that's what you rolled with, and that became sort of a standard because we knew like it's gonna appease everybody. It's what everyone knows now. It's what everyone's comfortable with. Um, but to prove that like <clears throat> this layout could work, George is like, you gotta you gotta prototype this now. You gotta get this thing built so we know if we gotta pull the plug on this thing, we we move with it. So we built this thing as quick as we absolutely could. Um, shot the shots, and sure enough, things were doing what didn't seem possible. And uh, once I got Gary on that thing, Gary's like, oh, this looks like a wide body in a standard cabinet. But he, he meant that in a good way. Um, but when he finally shot the thing, he hit that upper left shot, and it, like, swirled around. And he, like, let go of the flippers. He's like, what, you know, what the hell just happened? <laughs> so uh, he had me shoot it. And he's like, I still don't know what I just saw. So I had to like take the ball and like walk it around the shots to like, <laughs> so you could see what was happening there. Uh, but man, the the first time he like shot that X jet shot and it went behind the flippers and into the danger room and he one timed it up that ramp to that little hold uh, that's happening there at the end of that ramp. He started giggling and I knew like that that was it. That's all we that's all we had to prove. So it was it was awesome. Yeah. Hi, uh, so from, I'm from Los Angeles, so by chance I went to Revenge Up and ran into Todd Casey, who did the voice of Professor X. Yeah, and then, so it was cool to witness him like listening for his voice in the game like for the <laughs> first time, like, ooh, that was me. Um, but I, I'm curious for like you as a lead designer, when's the first time like you get to play the finished product and be like, this was my vision? Is it like a production model? Like, do you do it right away? Like, what's like, when did you get to see like, yes, this was my vision? It, it's definitely something that's evolving the entire time, right? And even like my vision evolves over time as I'm working with, you know, the software and the hardware and the audio, like they will have ideas that are like, you know, Jack, this would be cool if this happened. And like, well, geez, I didn't think anything about like a concept of coming over here. I had this like straight line of what I was trying to do. 
Um, so, like, as the team evolves with the game, the game evolves with us, and it just, uh, that, that vision ends up being what that game is, not what I wanted it to be, if that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Hi. Hey. Hey. Um, really fun game. Congratulations, guys. Thank it's you. awesome. Um, the theme integration is outstanding, and it really comes through that it was made by fans. So I have to ask you the standard dorky X-Men fan question. Uh. <laughs> Who is everyone's favorite? Ooh. Uh, I'll let everyone else go. <laughs> we'll start with Mark since he's the obvious one. Yeah. Because when... So at the beginning beginning of the project, well, I kind of jumped on maybe <laughs> quarter of the way through, and uh, these guys already had most of the game planned out. Um, Zach is a is one of our uh, production leads, and he 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 delegates the work, but he always gives us a choice. You know, what do you want to work on? All I said was Wolverine. I you know. I don't care whatever whatever you want me to do, but <coughs> just at least give me one Wolverine, <laughs> one shot at Wolverine. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah multiple shots. At multiple shot, yeah, multiple right. shots at Wolverine. But finally, actually, one of the th one of the things that happened early on, I was whispering to Jack and Wason early on. I said we got to do a fastball special. Oh yeah, we've got the fastball special on the art in the on the play field art, but I don't think they had anything planned for uh, for the mode. So. Just recently, w that's when uh, Josh and, and these guys collaborated to say fastball special. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so everybody up here, raise your hand if it's Wolverine. Yeah, right. And we can go faster. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. just <laughs> your Wolverine. Yep. I because personally like uh, Magneto because of Marvel vs. Capcom 2. So. Yeah, yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah. That's, 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 that's the one screen too, crouching shorts. Good answer. Good. And I, yeah. I hand painted a, a Wolverine on my bedroom wall when I was 10. So <laughs> it, it's, it's destiny. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had the, the first iteration of the X-Men collectible cards. For those of you who are about my age, remember those. And, um, like, I had the whole set, of course, because who wouldn't? Uh, but back then, probably my favorites were, like, Kitty Pride and Rogue. Just because, like, they have... Kitty Pride, they were like opposites in a way because Kitty Pride was like the every person and with the very defensive uh, abilities, and Rogue was like, you know, the bad guy turned good, you know, with a complicated backstory and a lot of depth to her. So there, it was a good contrast between the two. So this question was actually asked to me by Jeremy when he was drawing up cabinet art. He's like, Jack, favorite X-Men. And I was like, it's got to be Gambit. And that's who ended up on the side of the premium there. And that's why he's right up close. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> More questions? Hey, guys. This is a question about the, the audio. Um, so typical Pimo machine, right? It's two speakers and a sub, correct? Right. It's like a 3 point, 2 point, 3 point. What is it called? 2.1, 3 point. 2.1, right? So when you're... <laughs> sure, let's go with that. Yeah, whatever. Like, Mr. Um, Mom, what are you going to wear that? 220, 221? Yeah, whatever works. Yeah, whatever works. <laughs> whatever works. Um, in designing the audio, though, are you considering the stereo stuff? Oh, yeah. Feel it all? I love to do stereo stuff. Yeah, with a, if, it, if you're shooting an orbit shot to the left or right, I like to pan stuff or... Um, you know, or ramps, things like that. Yeah, yeah. I did that on the pop bumpers actually. So Bishop is on the left, uh, Gambit's on the right, and so those pop bumpers will—you'll hear more out of the side they're on. So it's, it, it sounds really great in headphones when you do that too. Heck yeah. <laughs> question is, is it going to be? I'll, I'll let Jeremy <laughs> answer that because he's a lot cockier than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> can I can I throw a question he, back at he's you? He's not in the room, so <laughs> there's less green in this one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good point. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. Um, but uh, the black and white uh, 70th anniversary uh, X Men will be out next. Uh, <laughs> Hey, excellent game. I, I got one. I'm picking it up tomorrow, so love well, it. You're talking. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, can you talk about the Cerebro and the floating ball? Because I don't think I've seen something like that in a pinball machine before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Cerebro was a bit of a journey on this game. It, is, it did not start where it currently is. It was tucked in the back corner of the game at one point with a diverter. The ramp was always was originally there. Mm-hmm. 
we moved it later, but that ramp was there. Right, right. There was a wire form there, but it, yeah, it's just kind of it, it made more sense to bring it forward, bring it as a main feature of the game. And and when that happened, and and these guys told me we need to hold a ball there. I'm like, you want me to put a, a post that goes through the in lane up to a ramp to do you what? No, 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 no. So the, the a post uh, but, under the ball would have sucked, yes. but it would have worked ish. But, we saw this perfect opportunity though because we have that uncommon left in lane that's that's the the like half half circle round in lane that needed a post in the middle anyway so i thought well maybe we can disguise a bald hold as this post and make it look like it's part of the wire form so if you look carefully um, that post uh, at that in lane actually rotates just a little bit about 45 degrees when it's at rest it looks like it's supporting the wire form and then it moves forward to to catch the ball. So it's a it's a very uh, hidden in plain sight type of mech. No magnets involved. It's just a, a simple post. Um, it's I think my favorite part of the game because yeah. it's it's so simple. It's very and simple. Clean. Yeah. It also has a rubber on it, so you can perform a post pass on it like mm -hmm. you would uh, going left and right. Um, and up until like two or three weeks ago, we would still have people internally going like, Jack, I don't think you're allowed to magnetize a rail like that to hold a ball. <laughs> yeah. And we're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah. All right, folks, thank you so much. Uh, go play X-Men, and thank you all for the feedback. Let us know how it plays.